So, uh, welcome everyone to to another around the block talk. Today we have with us uh, Mr. Sunny Vash. He's the CEO and founder of Organic Ledger, working in the domain of uh, food traceability, and uh, he's he's an industry veteran, having spent several years in the industry. So, Sunny, I'll hand it over to you. We are very excited to hear what you have to share with us. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a ton for uh, inviting me here. It's a uh, it's great to be here. Uh, as you all know, my name is Sunny Rash. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Organic Ledger. I have over 12 years of experience in technology and finance, uh, working across various countries like UK, Denmark, and India. Uh, I would like to start with giving a small introduction about uh, what we are doing at Organic Ledger. And then I would like to take everybody's attention towards the DeFi world and why is it important to know the basics and how important it would be for times going ahead. I would like to share my screen so that people have a view of uh, some graphics which would help them explain it in detail. So uh, as we all know, the journey of raw food material Produced at the farm and same being served on your plate is extremely long and eventful. Our food supply chain has gone from being local to being global in the past few decades. So, especially with organic products, uh, there are a lot of issues which have come up. You know, we do not know if it's actually organic and safe, or is it laced with harmful pesticides and chemicals? Is it really from the place where it claims to be? When was it harvested? Uh, is the high price justified? Recalls, especially in the developed nations, amount to about $30 million in direct and indirect cost um, and can uh, result in irreversible brand reputation damage. And as you know, the food fraud industry is extremely huge and there needs to be some, you know, something done to uh, counter that. So consumers are confused about the term organic uh, uh, even though if it's one of the most regulated food labels in the world, uh, if we truly want to educate our consumers on where their food comes from, we need to go beyond the one word marketing terms like you know, organic, sustainable, net zero carbon, stable, labor free, etc., etc., and lift that curtain for the end consumer to actually check and verify these details by themselves. Uh, according to recent studies, uh, around 75% of consumers have said that they would pay more if there is visible transparency in the school supply chain. So despite being a multi-billion dollar industry, uh, organic suffers from low tech adoption. Uh, in the past 12 months, I have visited or met around 400 odd brand owners across India. Uh, and they have replied positively with their approval of organic ledger or a similar solution which would help them showcase their authenticity, their uh, you know transparency, their traceability of the uh, product. And uh, our product design reflects that understanding and the feedback of these clients from starting. So blockchain, which is the base of our product, its main promise is like a trust machine. It can improve transparency, accountability for infrastructure projects by orders of uh, extreme magnitude. It can facilitate and uh, improve the monitoring of financial operations where it's like extremely huge, uh, thus it can have social environmental uh, impact if uh, you know created perfectly in the right direction. The data generated by IoT device, which is second phase of our project, such as smart sensors, can reduce the cost associated with the planning and preparation of such projects. It will make uh, key assumptions used in any project. Uh, even if it's finance modeling, much more accurate, including the forecasting of revenue and the cost. 
through organic ledger solution powered by blockchain and iot will provide unique advantages like traceability transparency trust decentralized structure time stamping of this whole process quality data analytics improve security with the cryptography of blockchain improved privacy and reduction in the overall cost uh, as you know blockchain and iot are web3 uh, technology and world economic forum has predicted that blockchain integration in the supply chain will improve their sales by at least 15% that is their research so consumers uh, they appreciate the transparent food information and they recognize the brand with traceability improving that marketing perspective for brand owners our brand owners can analyze and optimize their whole supply chain process uh, they can engage directly with the consumers through our platform and collect valuable data about them uh, obviously they can provide their proof of quality and sustainability claim they can unlock the export possibilities in the country that require that traceability information i would like to give an example in the uk uh, they have published a white paper last year at the end of last year which is called vision 2025 in there they have specifically mentioned that after a certain time frame all the food which is imported into the uk has to be traceable on blockchain itself they have mentioned the technology of blockchain in that white paper so that means one that but once uk implements such law it's not far away that other countries will follow suit in the same developed environment For example germany france us denmark sweden so which are exporters or importers of food that can include gcc as well uh, right. uh, our brand owners they can automate the product recalls and narrow down the scope of affected batches so everybody knows about the event which happened in the US. Um, there was a Walmart issue with um, icebergs, uh, like lettuce. One batch was infected with salmonella and it created a huge, huge cry uh, uh, where a lot of people got infected. And there was a very big issue where the whole batch of lettuce was taken off the shelf for around a month. It could not trace back the problematic batch. It took around a month. So that is up. That's why this technology needs to be implemented in wider scale. If once that happens with any product, the traceability can detect that batch, let's say five, 10 seconds. And only that batch can be taken off the shelf, uh, like reducing the impact. Okay, so this is how we plan to do it. Uh, we plan to connect every pack of our product with a QR code as a digital twin and link it with the provenance and journey of that batch. Uh, our database will provide all the necessary information uh, which is required for the stakeholder confidence in that network and it will act like a bridge of trust. What we want to do is we want to take India from low trust colony to a high trust economy using the technology where people would trust technology rather than themselves. Our product is a software and uh, a platform of services including a big part of data capture. Uh, we are building data formalization where the inputs from various sensors can be converted to one single readable data format. Uh, uh, extremely important aspect of our whole project is crypto tokens. We are adding crypto tokens as incentivization strategy and staking mechanism in the stakeholder community to promote the correct behavior. Okay. Right. This is the whole base layer of traceability and a lot of technology, a lot of features will be added on top of it, like uh, e-commerce, you know, AI ML based advisory, a lot of uh, Features are required for a complete solution for the industry to accept or to implement in a wider scale. So traceability is just one part of it. 
okay from now i would like to take everybody's attention uh, from organic ledger towards the world of defi or decentralized decentralized finance uh, as a knowledge base is very limited especially in the indian context of this extremely important uh, future technology that would impact everyone's life in coming years if people think it's not it's just a technology which is used by certain investors or a certain class of people it's not the case everybody would be connected to defi at some point in future which might be sooner or all later so what is decentralized finance um, it all started with open finance movement after the crash of 2008 everybody knows about satoshi uh, nakamoto like uh, how we developed it so decentralized finance aims to provide financial services without the legacy intermediaries using the automated protocols on blockchain and stable coins to facilitate the fund transfer uh, you guys might be amazed but almost 2 billion people in the world lack proper access to what you can call basic financial banking services um so banking their own savings being able to get a loan and so on it's sometimes difficult defi is powered through smart contracts and actually allows that everyone with an internet connection can make use of these application and even can create decentralized application launch them on a public network make it possible that uh, making it possible that financial services of any kind are open to anybody if it's worthy it will be used if it's not worthy the community will just discard so as you know the, the most important difference between web2 and web3 is the community the, the community of web3 the the developers the stakeholders they continuously look after what is what is being offered in the space and the acceptance at a wider scale only happens when the scrutiny has been completed by the experts so the common people who not have that knowledge of defi they can have a uh confidence that once the project is at, uh, distributed as a at, at a wider scale it is somewhat free from a lot of issues so uh, there is of course now with growing popularity of these applications uh traditional financial institutions are also making it a part of their portfolio uh but there has been risk attacks and other issues which we should also consider uh, defi vulnerabilities are severe because of high leverage liquidity mismatches built in mistakes and smart contracts and a lack of shock uh, shock absorbing capacity of these protocols or these companies so it's not only a positive view people should have a balanced view somewhat of this whole technology <clears throat> so uh there is market volatility and of course also related risk to consider so web3 technology at our current stage is where internet was in 1992 to 95 but since the distribution of uh, internet is so strong compared to that era we can expect the adoption and maturity maturity uh, of the defi more faster than it took the internet so many years ago it took let's say 10 years for internet to mature maybe it will take 3 years for the defi protocols to mature to that level of acceptance so decentralized financial application uh, they consist of different layers of applications so and how are these layers connected to each other is something which people need to know so there is settlement layer protocol layer application layer aggregation layer uh, we are going to talk about how data and information is being shared and also what privacy solutions can be in place decentralized finance really offers uh, now solutions that cover any traditional finance services that you might be able to think of 
uh, I would like to uh, show by this uh, informative graphics that how the cross-border payment mechanism is being transformed using the DeFi technology. As you can see there, uh, the cross-border transactions are extremely huge industry with 43.5 T USD moving across borders every year almost. And the transaction cost is around $120 billion. It takes 72 hours approximately for the process to complete. It's very complex with a lot of legacy uh, chains and you know, for barriers. The proposed solution with the CBDC and tokenomics can take down that cost of let's say $120 billion and time frame of 72 hours with transaction cost of 20 billion and nearly real time settlement. That is the most important thing. We do not, at our current pace of evolution, we do not want to lose time. That's the most important commodity at our for, for our generation. So this is something which CBDC and tokenomics can solve at a very rapid pace. So uh, let's take in a uh, detailed view of uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so put simply in definition, the cryptocurrency is actually a form of payment that can be exchanged digitally for goods and services. Uh, most famous implementation of this block of blockchain technology is Bitcoin. Everybody knows that even people who have never heard about blockchain, they know about uh, Bitcoin. There are many more cryptocurrencies all across the world. Uh, newer and newer cryptocurrencies come every day. Uh, I think Ethereum or Ether, for at least, is now the second most famous. Monero uh, is also very famous. A very important discussion that everybody should know and understand is cryptocurrency should be seen as a store of value plus a means of payment. So store of value is basically that you can see it as a long-term investment because it's limited and it knows. Similar to example gold. Uh, uh, why we think it's important to discuss because, you know, the, Regulators of cryptocurrency, uh, they are not at that technological level as the community. So there are a lot of uh, misunderstanding between the government organizations and the technological advancements, which we are currently ongoing. Um, across the globe, Example, US, UK, they have accepted crypto, blockchain, coins, stable coins, everything in, into their economy. Even a lot of states in US, they have allowed DAOs to be registered. We also want India to be at the similar pace because if we will not go to that level of acceptance, we will lose out on the race like Web2, you know, we are just building the applications for others rather than, you know, uh, creating Amazon or Facebook or, you know, similar, you know, technological wonders, which we, we, which we, which we might have if, if we had more understanding of technology and more acceptance of technology, let's say 20 years back. So that's the uh thing which we want to you know convey that there are issues with with web3 but if we will start with simple steps maybe we can lead this space in coming years a lot of as you know our crypto entrepreneurs they are looking for other uh, geographical avenues with uh, favorable jurisdiction uh, it's, it's in news every day, so you know, people just can search. I'm not going to go going deep into that. So, example of uh, payment currencies are uh, 
Bitcoin, Dodge, Monero, and so on. Uh, then you have infrastructure cryptocurrencies. These are the cryptocurrencies that can be used as a means of payment, but they are mostly used to make uh, uh, use of their existing infra infrastructure on the blockchain network. Most famous examples, you know, is Ethereum, Ethereum Classic. But you see, there are also many different providers now. Example, uh, Polygon Edge, Polkadot, uh, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So um, then you have uh, cryptocurrencies for financial services. With financial cryptocurrencies, example are uh, Gnosis, Compound, where you can use them and uh, for, for, for uh, example to create your own financial assets. And then you can have that uh, service cryptocurrencies. Chainlink, uh, uh, then you have service cryptocurrencies. Chainlink is a good uh, example. It's actually where you also use the token link to pay for the Chainlink Oracle to uh, provide you with the correct data and the information. So let's, uh, let's go ahead with stable points. I think uh, a very easy definition to remember is that a stable coin is a type of cryptocurrency which is pegged against another asset. We have many different types of stable coins. The first one is the commodity backed uh, stable coin, which is uh, tangible and has in intrinsic value of some type. Example, uh, tether gold. Many examples are possible here. Uh, next, we'll have to be go towards the fiat backed stable coins, which means that stable coin here is in this case is literally pegged to a specific fiat currency, but in some cases to a combination of different fiat currencies. Then we have uh, the crypto backed stable points, which are, as you might have guessed, are pegged to a different cryptocurrency. And in some cases, it's also a basket of different stable points as well. Uh, then we have uh, the non collateralized style stable points, which are sometimes called algorithmic stable points, which make use of certain algorithms to make sure that they have certain stable price. Example are uh, Steam dollar or Nubits. And finally, we uh, have central banks, uh, decentralized currency or CBDCs, uh, which we'll shortly discuss. Uh, discuss like uh, India, US, everybody is working towards their own uh, CBDC. There has been growing interest in central banks and states to have their own cryptocurrencies all across the world. Uh, they are now looking to creating uh, digital currencies next to their fiat currencies. China has already done it and they have already tested it. Uh, stable coins can really become a part of national nations cryptocurrencies or currencies all across the world. Another important aspect of the DeFi world is oracles. So when you are dealing with a DeFi or decentralized finance application, uh, we always have to ask ourselves a question, how can we bring in the right data for our application? How can we make sure the integrity or the correctness of the incoming data is there? And sometimes people might say that's uh, why you have blockchain technology, but oracles are an important part and I'll explain you why it's uh, required. So oracles are independent third parties which provide certain information to smart contracts. And of, of course this information is crucial for these smart contracts to execute on the right moment based on the right information. So these in their own way form a bridge between the blockchain networks and an off-chain real world. Um, you know, this information is collected, it's verified, authenticated, eventually passed on to the blockchain uh, environment. So each Oracle solution uh, I have many different options out there, but depending on how you want to use it, uh, the Oracle solutions were also designed. Example, I think uh, one of the famous uh, example of Oracle is Chainlink, which uses the link token, runs via the Ethereum blockchain, and its token can literally be used to pay nodes for the information. It's very clear, a uh, decentralized approach where nodes are verifying and collecting information across all the time. And when the data is verified, it can be shared with certain smart contracts um, 
there also a uh, example of band protocol it's where apis can be used to link to smart contracts again where you pay literally for to those nodes who uh, you know distribute that particular information to other um, examples are dia token and teller which provides financial institutions with financial data verification uh now we come to lending and saving and how it is transforming the defi world it's one of the biggest use case of defi um so as you might know there are there are several borrower and lender platforms out there uh, where lenders can actually provide loans through a very simply locking their cryptocurrencies or assets into smart contracts on which they receive interest rates based upon time uh they keep their fund locked into the contract at same time borrowers can also enter into contract to make use of their uh, certain cryptocurrencies for their own investment uh, use cases and so on first of all one of the most uh, popular one is compound uh, within compound in environment c tokens are used uh, c tokens are used to pay interest to the users and then you also have com tokens which is very specifically used, uh, designed for the governments of that platform which was issued in the starting so this is used to help vote based on the number of com tokens you have uh, and it creates a stability on the future of the environment on how the borrowing and lending is going to take place very important to know it's also a bit of criticism uh and it's not completely decentralized compound is a, a bit of centralized uh, structure uh most shares to this day uh, remain with a small amount uh, group of people which means that they are very much in still control of the future uh, uh on top of that uh, a bug led to distribution of over 90 million usd uh into the community by accident uh, because based on the number of tokens you have you can receive certain payouts so uh, people need to understand the uh, one more important aspect between web2 and web3 for an example if you go and sell your products on amazon you are going into contract with amazon but amazon being a centralized platform they can change that rules and regulations at any point depending on their uh governance right with without informing that user or with, without uh, informing that uh, seller but in the environment of web3 everything is governed democratically so if somebody wants to change something at least 51% of people have to say yes then only that uh change can take place so that is one of the most important difference between web2 and web3 so a uh, second example of lending and, and borrowing is aave which is pool based strategy where multiple currencies are put in reserve and total liquidity is defined by the ether in the pool which is a bit different approach uh yeah move on to the next uh uh i want to introduce you to the maker protocol which is a multi collateral dai system where dai is generated by leveraging collateral assets provided by the maker governments and this token is soft backed by the us dollar you can either proactively or reactively vote on certain currencies so as you can see even the platforms that are really focusing on reducing the risk uh they are also facing issues but as i told you before we are just at the beginning of this whole evolution and once we take steps at in the right direction we will create an environment which is completely secure and trustworthy um synthetics and and derivatives uh they are a bit risky for uh, investment but obviously linked linked with uh, higher payouts so in traditional world of finance uh, as well there are uh, uh, derivatives so on top on top of financial risk we need to consider and we should know that 
there can be possible bugs as well, uh, which we need to be eliminated, which needs, which needs to be eliminated in the Web3 world. So first example, uh, as I've told, it's uh, a very popular protocol called synthetics and synthetic means, as you know, it itself means synthetic products, which are collateralized by the synthetic network token or SNX. The SNX token can be used in smart contracts to use or to issue SINs. So synthetic assets, and there's always a conversion possible between different SINs. So there is, a 750% collateralization ratio for the synthetic contracts to keep or to reduce at least the risk to an acceptable amount. If it drops below that ratio, there is no reward for the stakers until it's back up to that required ratio. So at least, at least there is a way to protect the investors and help creators understand that they are dealing with certain risk when uh, going towards synthetic protocols, assets protocols. Second uh, example is uh, Puma, which is self-enforcing contract design pattern where Oracle are placed to provide correct data to the platform and tries to address the possibility of, let's say, counterparty risk. Again, one of the uh, important use case of DeFi is insurance. Uh, so decentralized uh, insurance, for example, the automated smart contracts can basically make use of certain events and it's verified by oracles before the payout can take place. This reduces uh, the legacy systems uh, heavy burden of uh, collecting data, verifying data, you know, going through those 100 to 100 steps before a payout can be issued. So this, uh, as you uh, makes up uh, the whole process paperless and much faster. An example of uh, this insurance is Nexus Mutual, which resides on top of Ethereum network. It makes use of smart contracts through which they believe they can reduce the administrative cost by at least fifteen percent when compared. You no. Know, their claims assessment happens through a voting mechanism where all the involved parties, parties or participants are allowed to vote on certain events that have taken place or whether a claim should be approved or not. So, next, uh, tokenization. Uh, tokenization is the creation of tokens or virtual assets, which represents different assets. Uh, these can be assets in physical world, but also in the similar stage in the virtual world. Easiest to explain is the example of real estate where existing building, a house, a property is actually transferred and becomes uh, an existing entity on the blockchain. Example, in Australia, a company is making the NFTs of house, and you can buy that NFT and uh, own that house. So instead of going through the whole registry process in the real world, you can own just the NFT and uh, can be owner of that house. Uh, so obviously, you know, uh, tokenization does not mean that you know one token can represent just one building. That means that you can also own very small share of the same building put together with a lot of different uh, investors. Uh, people would ask like, why is it interesting? Because you know it's cheaper, it's faster, more secure, and more private than many of the other options currently out there. Uh, by tokenizing the equity, uh, by, by tokenization, uh, we can also issue equity and debt to the financial infrastructure or the whole portfolio of a uh, project. Now, these tokens are classified as uh, financial securities, hence uh, issuers are 
have to comply with certain financial regulations sometimes as well. Create certain value for you to participate in the technology, which might change the future. Sure, uh, thank you, Sunny, for that wonderful and informative presentation. And uh, I believe we saw the entire breadth of DeFi today. And so many products out there for you know, uh, many different uh, financial instruments. And, uh, and definitely, it's the, I'm sure uh, adoption is something which we would see in the coming years, especially in India where the adoption is lacking. So uh, very good to know about this. And so thank you for the talk. And uh, so uh, can, uh, can we have a few question answers, if that's OK with you? Yes, please. Okay. That's great. So you know, one thing that you mentioned was uh, uh, the international payments, and and that is something we definitely hear. The first thing that we hear with DeFi is you know that is going to simplify international payments. So what do you think are the steps there in the international payment? What are the challenges there, and how is DeFi going to solve that? So once we move a step towards CBDC and its adoption so uh, instead of using the traditional banking layer we can transfer the funds between entities which are verified through kyc by their governments so instead of going through several layers of uh, legacy systems we can just use it from one kyc to other kyc the cbdc would change hand using protocols and instead of let's say seven to ten layers of uh, banking network it would just be a couple of central bank uh, execution network for payment to be transferred right so a lot of intermediaries are not required now right sense. right and that reduces the cost and that makes it more efficient right so let's say if, if we have somebody who is uh, selling something to the UK and they do not want to wait for the payment, for the product to reach to the UK, mm -hmm. that which will take, let's say, a month and another 15 days for the payment to be processed. It can be done on a DeFi network where the oracles would approve that the product has been shipped mm -hmm. in a perfect condition and the payment can proceed from the end of receipt. So this is a scenario which is actually being implemented currently. It's not very wide, but yes. Okay. So you will uh, people ask, ask what is what is the benefit of being a uh, Oracle node? The Oracle node stakes their coin for being the participant and uh, giving right information, they earn that certain number of points. Right. Right. And if they do not uh, provide that right information, they would lose their stake points. Plus, they would lose their reputation and their uh, acceptance to be part of that network. So right. they will be ousted. So they have the uh, responsibility to provide correct information, both in economically and regulatory senses. Right, right. So I was so, uh, coming sorry? to that question. Uh, I was actually coming to that question. You know, since Oracle is playing such an important role, it is providing us with, with, with very sensitive data to be able to execute those smart contracts. How do we actually trust these Oracles? How do we make sure, you know, there's they're working properly. And uh, would you can you throw some more light on what these oracles are exactly and how they're functioning? So oracles are nodes, and behind that nodes there can be IoT sensors. There can be certain uh, person who wants to stake their own wealth in terms of coin to be a participant. Mm -hmm. So it's not a free of cost thing. You stake something, you put something, and if you provide correct information, which is verified across networks. So it's not just if that one oracle says, yes, it is day, 
everybody believes it believes it there needs to be a mechanism where let's say 20 oracles says yes that there is day for that acceptance to take place right so right. yeah so that is how that is how it uh, the governance model works okay great great so, so uh, uh, yeah so instead of you know the whole paperwork it's all going towards the digital world actually that is the difference between web2 and web3 right sorry to disturb you please continue right so uh, and uh, you know as you mentioned that defi is understood very narrowly especially mm. in the only in terms of crypto so you know there as you mentioned there are so many defi products even on existing uh, even on an existing financial system of fiat and our assets there are a lot of defi which is possible so uh, where what kind of products do you see for the country like india what what do you think uh, is going to happen for us if we take a country like india as i've told you before i have been living in several countries so if you take an example of phone number to phone number payment transfer i was using that in the uk in 2010 it was created by natwis bank but in the what we call upi right now so in india the adoption took place after 2014 15 and now only now after like 7 8 years we are realizing the true potential of that technology and how it can be benefit only after seeing it perfectly executed in a environment which is at better technological level than us so what i believe or what i believe i cannot say about industry we need uh, countries like us uk australia to execute certain defi uh, systems first example the nft of uh, real estate to be passed from one owner to the other and uh, how it would be integrated into the regulatory framework perfectly fine and then only we can let's say take inspiration and execute it there until then i am not sure if we go ahead with any defi adoption in the near future right. yes people uh, yet yeah, the governments the government in india is going ahead with the blockchain integration in the land owners ownership so where you can on the blockchain you can check the ownership from past right instead of you know going through all the paperwork and which might be true or which might be not which might not be true so that is one application which might happen in let's say couple of years like digitization of data on blockchain a lot of certification of education is happening on blockchain uh we are building the network for the industry with that might happen but the defi would take some time and that would take some inspiration from the other economies to be perfectly executed in india right right so we probably have to uh, first perfect uh, those application in a in a more sound environment and then right. can right but it is already being tested and executed in developed nations as we speak right right okay great great so you know finally coming to organic ledger itself and so uh, you are working on the supply chain and the traceability of food items and you know, various uh, organic material and so one thing that you mentioned that you you are building a token economy around that to actually uh, Know, to to incentivize every player to uh, to do their best towards the common goal so how how do you actually go about building this token economy how do you understand you know what are the components needed so with token economy you have its own monetary and fiscal policy kind of a thing how tokens are being generated how they are being transferred so how, how do you actually go about designing that um it would take a pilot perfectly executed we are still in a 
production, uh, which is we are still in development stage. So I cannot reveal a lot of uh, you know details right now. But hopefully it will be implemented and the stakeholder community, including the consumer, will be a part of it so that they can also scan, earn the rewards and execute that tokens to benefit from that brand owners through you know discount or free products and things like that. So example, a lot of rewards mechanism which we are experiencing in to date in in day to day life can that can be done on the DeFi level. Right. So I believe you no know, everyone then become a brand owner from a customer to a to a producer to 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 an intermediary. That's that's what you're trying to do, is it? They would be part of that community. Right. They would have to stake certain uh, points for perfect execution and that would create an environment of trust. So right. that is the that is the uh, thinking behind it. Right, right. So, so in order yeah. to, right, we're trying to so once once you you know once a once a player is rewarded for doing the right mm -hmm. uh, behavior, they would be lured or incentivized again and again for executing the perfect uh, supply chain process instead of you know doing something which might jeopardize this whole environment. Right, right. And what kind of industry disruption do you see with uh, this technology? What is the size of disruption uh, are you predicting? With DeFi or with organic the, ledger? Organic ledger. So uh, right now we are just focusing on organic industry. Organic industry is almost a billion dollar industry in India with annual CG, CGR of around 25% approximately. And plus a lot of products which we create in India is for export in Western countries. Mm -hmm. And if like while I was living in the UK or Denmark, the average income of person there, they can easily shift to healthier alternative of organic. Right, but they do not do so because there is no trust in the product. Right. Okay. For example, if you go to a supermarket and you see, let's say, four or five organic brands which says they're organic and they're like two times expensive. Maybe you have maybe the buyer has a capacity, but they want to verify that information for them to accept that product. So that is where we come in, where we verify the whole process, the certification, the traceability, and other details, and let the brand owners, uh, so let the consumers, be trust what they see. Right. So and you... then and and then they can easily you know be a part of that process and make a healthier world. So what our vision is more holistic. Uh, if you go back, let's say for 40 years, before the green revolution, as we call it now, we were all eating organic food. Um, there was no chemical laden product. So if you check your uh, great grandparents or grandparents, you know, they would live to age of 90, 95, 100, and they would not have blood pressure, they will not have uh, diabetes, thyroid, weak bones, you know, the things which we are exper experiencing now at the age of 35, 40, 45. The reason behind that is that we are eating food which is equal to uh, poison, I roughly say. It is like a uh, bodybuilder which has been injected with steroids. So instead of being a natural product, it's too artificial and that is disrupting our whole ecosystem. It's not going to be good. It's not going to be good for us. It's not going to be good for our uh, future generations. Another example I would like to tell you, when you were younger, when I was younger, 
when it when it used to rain, we used to see a lot of earthworms, which we do not experience now. Why? Because we have killed them all. The earthworms were the natural producers of uh, fertilizers. They were natural. They were part of that ecosystem, which were built from, let's say, twenty million years. And we have disrupted that in twenty twenty five years. It's not going to be good. We need to go back to the roots for our future generation to live in peace and harmony. Right. That's uh, that's good to know. You have a mission and vision. Uh, you have that. And so yeah. You, yeah. So yeah, example, like let's say a farmer who is doing organic products, he is getting he is facing difficulties of selling that product. But once he will see that there is an acceptance of that product and there is a good value of that products, it can spread like wildfire in that community. They can add more farmers. They can add more land and move towards more organic. There might be difficulty, but maybe it would create a better future for everyone. Right. right. So uh, with that, Sunny, I think we can conclude our talk. And it was very nice to meet you. And you're clearly very passionate about uh, DeFi, crypto, and organic ledger and blockchain. Thank you. So uh, nice to meet someone very passionate about it. and uh, good to have you thank you <clears throat>